This is a conversation with Morgan Gis McDonald, founder and CEO of Paper Raven Books. With her service, she helps writers become published authors. Writing a best-selling book can be a huge leverage for a business or a personal brand. It could be your ticket to being invited to speak on podcasts, events, and other formats so you can promote other products and services of yours. Authority comes from author. And if you want to learn what it takes to write a book and make it successful in the US, you should listen to this podcast. See you inside. So what does a paperravenbooks.com actually do? We are a self-publishing services company, meaning that we work with authors who want to self-publish a book, but don't want to go through the hassle of <laughs> figuring out how do I find a great editor or ghostwriter? How do I get the cover design, the interior design? How do I publish the book, market the book? All those things. It's a, it's a, you know, it's not a complicated process, but it is a foreign process to most people. And so if they're going to come out with a book that's going to be the, you know, backbone of their business or their next career, you know, they want it done well. And so we're, we're a team that comes locked and loaded to help them from book concept to publish, launch, marketed book. Okay, I understand. So, um, so basically, yours is a service in which you help others publish books. Is that correct? Um, and how did you get to found that company? How did how did you start that? Yeah, like I mean, so many of us, <laughs> we don't know what we're doing exactly when we get into entrepreneurship. We sort of figure it out as we go. Um, but I was in a, actually, I was in a doctoral program for sociology. I thought I was going to be a professor mm. of sociology uh, and realized that academia was, was not a fit for me. <laughs> Had just a little bit too much of that entrepreneurial uh, bent to me. But I loved working with uh, the folks in the program who were writing. So I was working with a lot of folks, uh, just who are my colleagues or junior faculty on articles, theses, dissertations, monographs, which are books, academic books, and decided, well, I think I will uh, go off on my own. I left after the master's, went off on my own and started working with writers independently, writing, coaching, book editing, and had enough people who came back and said, okay, thank you for helping me with my book. How do I get it published? And that really was the uh, the question that the multiple times, you know, as an entrepreneur, you get asked a question often enough and you're like, oh, there's, a, there's something in the market that is missing for these folks. So I didn't know how to publish a book. So I wrote a book, published it figured mm -hmm. out the process, and then took some early clients through the process. And that was in 2015. So we've been, um, you know, creating those best practices and optimizing that process and growing the team. Uh, now, you know, we, first year we started with just a handful of books. Now we're doing about 60 books a year. And we have a lot of repeat authors who say this was such a fantastic experience. Let's do another book together. So it's been it's been very fulfilling. Awesome. So did I get that right? You wrote a book in order to go through what's necessary for helping other people write a book? Yeah, exactly. So well. <laughs> what, what was that book about? So that book is uh, very straightforwardly called Start Writing Your Book Today. <laughs> it's about how okay. to write a book. <laughs> That's what I knew, right? You write, a, you write a book on what you know, and it's um, it's just, it's fairly short, you know, again, straightforward, practical guide on everything that I was doing with clients, but just laid out my framework in a book with, you know, some stories and helpful hints and things like that. And it's got almost uh, getting up to 2000 reviews on Amazon. So it's, you know, it's helping people. And I get reviews every, do reviews every week about how it's been helpful for, for folks. So that's been, uh, that's also been really just enjoyable. I don't think I would have pushed myself to publish a book had people not asked me, you know, to help them with that. Okay, that's interesting. So First of all, I think it's always interesting to figure out like whether someone should write a book or not. If so, about which topic? Can you help me with that question? So who should write a book actually? Yes. So I, I do think that there are a couple of sort of push-pull factors in whether someone might want to write a book. So I feel like the, the, um, the push factor is that I, as an author, um, I have stories things I want to share, experiences I've been through. You know, some people tell me all these crazy events that have happened in their lives that they just, they want to share. Um, and I don't think that's quite enough um, for for a book that's going to be commercially successful and, and truly helpful to people. I think there also has to be that pull factor. There have to be people who um, are going to benefit 
from whatever it is you're going to share. And so, you know, for for many of us who are coaches, consultants, content creators, we are we are used to that kind of framework. And we're used to thinking about, okay, mm-hmm. what's what are the lessons learned, the principles, the best practices that I need to share with an audience? And I would suggest that both of those components have to be there. And there really has to be that content must be helpful for the reader. So you have to find that kind of overlap between what do I want to share and what is truly going to be helpful. And, you know, I'll just, I, this may not be the most, um, you know, kind <laughs> advice, but there are many people who like you start talking and you tell crazy stories from your life and the other person across the table says, oh, you should write a book about that. I don't mm-hmm. know that that means you should actually write a book. I think they're actually just saying that you tell a lot of crazy stories <laughs> and they don't really know how to respond. And so they say, well, I guess you should write a book about that because you have a lot to say <laughs> about your crazy life. Um, I don't think that that book is necessarily going to be, as I said, you know, commercially successful unless the mm. reader really has an experience in the book. You know, what are they going to get out of it? Okay, sure. Crazy stories, at least take them through a narrative arc. You know, if it's going to be just stories from your life, it's got to be as entertaining as a novel. And if it's not that, if it's your classic nonfiction book, then it's got to be helpful. (laughs) So which is it? Is it going to be entertaining like a novel or is it going to be helpful like a nonfiction book is kind of how I tend to to break it down in in simple terms. Okay, so so anyone who has something to share should write a book or at least interesting stories. I have some I have some funny stories. I I have. For example, I was in in between, of, like Paris Hilton was filming her biography of, on, on Netflix, that documentary. I I believe it came out on, on YouTube or something. I don't know. Um, and I was like in between a fight between her and her ex-boyfriend, and things like that, whom I randomly knew. That's 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 kind of interesting. Yeah, I have a lot of funny stories like that well you know you might um, think Sven, but uh, i think oh go ahead yeah please go ahead i there are a couple of ways in which people tend to become successful like as an author um one way is you publish a lot of books for the same type of reader this is what's pretty classic for fiction and memoir you know and, and so maybe if you had a lot of crazy celebrity stories you know you could publish multiple books on that same topic or genre for the same type of reader the other way is your classic nonfiction. I am a coach, consultant, speaker. I publish a book and I want to bring in clients for the back end. So, you know, typically it's either you're making money because you're releasing multiple products for the same market (laughs) or um, you're releasing one product that is going to feed into a bigger back end. So I don't know what that means for you, Sven, and your Paris Hilton stories. You might need a lot more Paris Hilton stories. You might be, you become a tabloid then. in my in my case, I would publish um, I would publish uh, nonfiction books um, about like practical advice for affiliate marketing. Um, my company, Digistore Twenty Four, is an online platform, a reseller platform, which integrates a lot of payment services, so you can get paid selling yeah. electronic uh, goods uh, like membership areas, uh, software. Uh, ebooks, uh, online courses, events, even supplements and books, uh, basically stuff that you would sell like in, in some kind of direct response marketing funnel, which is like measurable and very effective uh, when it comes to selling stuff online, as opposed to the traditional bookstore type of thing in which you would compete with all the other authors. So traditionally, my clients... Uh, sell their uh, online information through online funnels, like very dedicated, very specific. Like someone, for example, would um, see an ad on Facebook or Instagram or Google, or they would even Google like a certain question, like, for example, how can I lose weight? And then they would find some weight loss offer that would um, lead them into a direct response type of funnel. And this is basically what my company does. So... I think if I were to write a book, it would be about affiliate marketing, online marketing, things like that. Very like not so. Um, I was more joking about uh, the Paris Hilton story. It's it's I, I'm more like a, a 
yeah, an entrepreneur type guy who helps other pre- entrepreneurs. That's actually my mission to become successful. Well, can I ask you a question, so, Sven? Of course. So, so we're talking about Digistore 24, right? Um, and I'd be curious, like if you and I were to start talking about, okay, Sven, what, what could a book look like for you? Yeah. I'd be curious about um, whether there's any sort of philosophical underpinning. Like why do you approach direct response marketing through e-commerce the way that you do? So I like to think about the ultimate purpose. So the ultimate purpose is to make a company, an entrepreneur successful to sell their products, basically. And there are certain ways to do that. There is ways um, that are completely offline. There, there are ways online. And there is also like kind of a niche that I fit in with my service. I... I also have sold a lot of books about weight loss, muscle building, dating, stuff like that, but only through direct response channels because I could measure them. The problem for me, if I were to sell it like through some some bookstore, some traditional bookstore or maybe even an online bookstore, would be I could not track the whole customer journey. I could not uh, make the whole customer journey, like for example, the 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 whole uh, travel from ad to landing page to sales page email newsletter mm-hmm. i could not do that but uh, the beautiful thing about direct response marketing about online marketing that's done that that's done that way is that you can kind of design the whole customer journey and, uh, and answer all the questions that the customer has on that journey and that's what makes it so interesting for me you can measure everything and you know i did not found any company with uh, venture capital or external money i just bootstrapped everything and for me it was very very important to be able to track um every contact point every customer journey milestone if you will so that i don't lose money i don't waste too much money on that journey and i think that's that's a very it's it's empowering for a lot of entrepreneurs. Like there's also, of course, I'm aware of that, a big, I call it startup culture, startup world in which like someone starts a company by making a pitch deck, pitching it to potential investors. I don't come from that world. My world world is, okay, I have an idea for an ebook in this case, and I want to sell this ebook and I need to do it very effectively, very efficiently. I know what my ad spend is, I know what my conversion rates are, I measure them constantly and I try to make a little bit more money uh, than I have to spend on ads and on, you know, costs and infrastructure and everything. And this is basically where where I come from. This is what my uh, Digistore 24 service is what it does. And I think it's a very healthy way to approach entrepreneurship as opposed to trying to rely on external money. So I think I like the whole idea of being self-sufficient, of self-help, if you will, because I think I think it can make sense to work with investors, but from a point of strength. Like you don't need them and then you might, you you want to talk. And then it's also like your business model no model is proven. It's also a nice thing. As opposed to, oh, I have this great idea and I want to sell around the idea. Um, I think it's great if you can start a business very easily, which you can do nowadays. Like it's so it's so simple to get a website up and start some service, uh, sell it through your website and just measure if you make enough return on your ad spend. I think that's that's a very healthy way. It's a very good way. And I'm like, I, I just like the, like the whole idea. And, and that's kind of my mission to help people, to enable people, help people by enabling them do that. So, so I'm, that's really cool. I do hear some just like, I'm just listening and, and listening for like what pieces would sort of, you could architect into kind of a, a narrative structure for a book like this. And I imagine you have your own kind of founder story. There's principles mm. of like, self-reliance, you know, independence as an entrepreneur, starting small and growing something very big. 
um, right? I mean, Digistore 24, you've founded multiple nine figure businesses, right? And so that's a really yeah. cool story. And you have case studies of people who didn't do nine figures, right? You probably have client success stories of people who started small and grew it to the size they wanted, right? And so there's this like ability, you, you can you can walk people through um, the ideas of, of self-reliance that you don't need to be backed by a big money. Um, so, so independence in your relationship with your own customers, you don't need to go through Target or Walmart or Amazon, right? You can, yeah. you can have that direct, almost like, you know, direct consumer relationship, which is really how you grow your, your base for your own audience, your own audience of buyers, uh, which is, which is way better than social media, right? So there's some, some, um, yeah. things that you can dig into there. Uh, and then, and then after that, I would say you can get into the the geeky, <laughs> you know, conversion rates and let's make mm-hmm. this all, you know, um, get, people get nervous about math and numbers. Um, but if they can buy into mm. the ph- philosophy of I don't need the big money, I don't need the big stores, I can have direct to consumer relationship, which gives me that self-reliance, start small, grow it as big as I want to, stop where I want to. Here's some examples of what people have chosen to do. And then kind of the how, best practices, mistakes. Sven, I think you've got a book. Thank you. Yeah, I like that. I, I actually thought about that a lot. Um, I, I, I just couldn't figure out like if it's really like the number one priority because there's so, so much things to do. Um, if someone, that, that's probably also a question you get a lot, mm-hmm. like, how how important do you see that like personally writing a book for an entrepreneur right i i do i think there's a couple of considerations um one is there's an overestimation of how much time it's going to take to write the book and there's mm-hmm. an underestimation around the amount of time it takes to take a first draft all the way through to publication and launch um so writing the book we typically found, and now we have a team of you know twenty folks, editors, designers, um, project managers, marketers, things like that on the team. So, so we've worked with thousands of authors at this point. So when mm-hmm. we kind of crunch all that data about um, how long it takes our folks to write books, it's somewhere in the ballpark of forty to eighty hours of sitting down in front of a computer and writing, because most folks if- that's a week, yeah. Yeah, it could be a week. It's not much. It could be five hours a week over eight to 10 weeks, something like that. Now, the key is you have to be somewhat organized on the front end. You kind of have to, you know, you want to make a list or a or a mind mm. map or something of what you're going to write. Because when you sit down to do the writing, you want to mostly be hands on the keyboard typing words, right? That's it. You want to do your thinking separate from your writing. But if you can do that, if you can do a lot of mm. you know, front end thinking, spend a couple weeks just sort of going, I like to do it in just a list. Keep it really simple. It's a linear experience. A book, they start the book and they read chapter by chapter and then they end the book. <laughs> so I just you know, create it as a bullet point list of all the topics and stories I want to cover in the book. But if you can create a list that you feel pretty comfortable with, um, and you can talk it through with anyone on your team or any of your clients and just get their feedback. Is this the right sort of um, uh, number of things for me to, to talk about? Am I missing anything? You know, get pretty solid on that list. Once you sit down to write, probably in the ballpark of a thousand words an hour, might be a little less, might be a little more, mm-hmm. it'll be messy, but 40 to 80 hours will typically get you somewhere around 40 to 60,000 words something like that, which is going to be a 250 page book. If, you know, if all those words survive the editing process, (laughs) which they may or may not. Mm. So that's first draft. And then after that, yes, you're going to involve editors and cover designers and formatters and, and folks like that. But then the burden's not all on your shoulders anymore, right? You've got team members who are doing a lot of that work. It might take six months to get the book, you know, finalized and ready if you especially if it's going to well whether it's ebook or print book it really has to go through yeah all the same process um so we typically do ebook and paperback and hardback and audiobook if if that makes sense for that particular type of book um so the first draft may not be as time consuming as you 
as you and many other folks might assume, Sven. So I would kind of encourage that. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, well, when do I take these 40 to 80 hours out of my schedule? And that, I mean, I think some folks just know, like, now is the time I've been thinking about this book. I keep waking up in the middle of the night thinking about it. I've just got to get it out of my head and onto paper so that I can (laughs) focus again. I think sometimes that hits us. And then for me, it was, I was getting enough questions from people that I was like, screw it. If I launch this book, I'm going to have a hundred reviews right out of the gate because I've got a hundred people who keep blowing up my email, asking me these questions. Let me give them a book, <laughs> you know? And now mm. those people can come and help and spread the word of mouth. Um, it's it's a different kind of marketing, right? It's, it's not as direct response. It's more thought leadership. It's the same reason you would start a podcast, <laughs> you know, is, is, connections, appearances, mm. being a guest a guest expert, it adds to your your ability to get on stages and, and in front of other folks. So um, it's a it's an additional marketing outlet. Um, so when you feel like you've got things kind of humming a little bit in the current phase and you feel like you could uh, put in 40 hours or 80 hours on a on a manuscript, might be time. Does that help at all? Oh yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so in in like re- when I look at my topics, usually there are already a lot of books. Um, how do you how do you see that um, competition thing? Like there are a lot of books about online marketing and and online entrepreneurship and things like that. Um, do does the world really need another book? Because you can find all the information already in other books. Uh, so I didn't invent anything. How do you see that? Yeah, I mean, I felt very similarly. I mean, who needs another book on how to write a book? There are already, you know, classics in in that genre. Um, the The interesting thing about folks who read books as one of their primary ways of of gaining knowledge and and um, and just keeping their mind engaged in their topic is they'll buy a lot of books. You know, folks who buy books on mm-hmm. business or sales or marketing or or any of those sorts of things, they probably buy 20 books a year, if not more, mm-hmm. you know. And so they're they're mm-hmm. always looking for kind of another book. to. In, and many people will read books not because they expect the entire book to be mind-blowing, but because the book might give them one more angle, one more story. They're really sharpening the saw, you mm-hmm. know. And so many folks are, are, are when they're experts in their area are interested in continuing to consume content on this topic. So um, these your your avid readers are going to buy new books every year. They're looking for the next new book. Mm. Um, and then for you and for your platform, it's just different if you can, you know, come up and say you're introduced on stage and they say, you know, not only the founder of two nine figure mm. businesses and Digistore 24 and, you know, author of that da, da, da book that helps people to mm-hmm. know what your area of expertise and thought leadership is um so it's positioning cool and what does it take to make a book really successful because there's like publishing a book and there's bestsellers like how can i make sure that my book if i write a book is super successful how what, yeah. what are the factors that make it that way. So in the United States, we have the New York Times bestseller list, uh, which has sort of for yeah. decades been held up as kind of like the list that you want to hit. Um, but it's, you know, it's um, the whole concept of bestsellers list has gotten very interesting in the last really few years mm-hmm. um, because people have started to ask questions about how do these bestseller lists really get put together? Uh, what we know is that New York Times looks at the sales data from a Saturday to a Saturday and releases on a Sunday. Um, however, mo- what mo- most people don't realize is that there's still a, quite a few additional requirements. Um, it's not just sales data. It has to be from certain bookstores. So you have mm. to have a spread across the U.S. It has to be big box, you know, Barnes and Noble and independent. It has to be geographically representative according to someone's, you know, (laughs) calculations of, of kind of a, an impactful book. It has to have backing from an editor on the New York times. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, and there are plenty of 
studies and stories of books that have sold more in a one week period than the books on the New York Times bestseller list and were not listed. Right. So that in itself has started to like create some cracks. Um, typically, when you want to hit that kind of list, you're going out and you are pre selling the book. And those mm-hmm. bookstores are actually holding the orders until a specified launch date. So the author will do a book tour, they'll pre sell 10,000 copies of a book. And then all of those sales are released on launch day by the point of sale systems. Mm-hmm. So that's what creates 10,000 books sold, quote unquote, sold in a one week period. Now you hit the New York Times for one week. Does that mean something? Maybe. <laughs> you know, it means you can sell 10,000 books in six months, um, which mm-hmm. is a feat. But it's just created some questions about is this really the best goal? And then, of course, there were other lists. USA Today had a, a popular bestseller list. And there was apparently one guy who was in charge of the USA Today bestseller list, and he retired. And USA Today said, never mind, we're not doing a bestseller list anymore. <laughs> and so that was like, ah. interesting. You know, it, it, it sort of is calling into question, like, what is the use of these bestseller lists? So what I tend to focus on and, and encourage you know our authors to focus on is we want you know to 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 make the the any of our book sales page assets as um, as high converting as possible, right? So if we're going to sell the book on Amazon, which is just an online bookstore, basically, uh, you know, we want to make sure that anyone who comes to that page is going to have a high likelihood of converting, right? Of of picking up a copy of mm-hmm. that book, and there are some things that move the needle there. Obviously, the cover, title, subtitle. But you can add things like endorsements and praise blurbs, and you can mm. stack it with reviews. And certainly, if you hit you know certain rankings in the Amazon bookstore, the algorithm will show your book more widely in the bookstore. So we think a lot about how to optimize the book actually inside of Amazon simply for discoverability, uh, because so many mm. readers who are browsing, they are going to Amazon. They are just typing in yep. keywords like they do Google or any of those other search engine platforms. So we're thinking about keywords. How many searches can we get the book in front of? We're thinking about categories. How can we make sure we're hitting number ones in relevant categories so it's visible? And then when people land on that page, how do we make sure that page is high converting um, so that you know they see the social proof and, and are more likely to, to buy the book? Once that is set up, Okay, yes, let's take it out to podcast tours and build, you know, put it on your web page and social media and, you know, get influencers on TikTok to talk about it, that sort of thing. Um, but we really focus much more on that ground support uh, because that's where the author's building their own readership. Sure, nice to hit a New York Times bestseller. Does it happen with your first book? Not typically. So let's not worry about that for the first book, right? Let's get your platform. Now you, Sven, you have a platform. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it might be that you could do something like organize a book tour across the US, sell 10,000 books in a six-month period pre-order, let those bookstores release, you know, um, on a particular date and hit the list. You know, that's essentially how it would work. You might have to find a friend at the New York Times (laughs) to vouch for your book. (laughs) So so, so the way would be I have my book written, but I'm not selling it yet. And I I do have an audience and I would email to my audience, hey, I'm in this this and that town at this and that time. And if you oh. want to listen to me talk about that book, then you can. Is that correct? Would that be the way? Yeah, it, the order has to be processed through a bookstore, unfortunately, mm-hmm. which is somewhat um, contrary to your direct, <laughs> yeah, you know, direct yeah. response to consumer <laughs> style. Uh, but but for the purposes of hitting the list one week, uh, yes, you could you know go to the states, organize a multi month book tour, and just tell people I'm going to be making presentations. Uh, for nonfiction authors in particular, I think you can just do a a workshop, a presentation, you know, a free. Mm-hmm a free 30 minute thing where I'm going to walk you through how I built, you know, Digistore 24 or how, you know, I'm going to walk you, I'm going to, as you would with any webinar, right? You make a snappy hook and that sort of thing, get people into the door, um, give them a short presentation and say, if you love this, buy my book, 
here's the stack of bonuses <laughs> as we do, you know, that comes mm-hmm. with my book. There's the point of sale system right there. Go see that that nice Barnes and Noble person <laughs> and and process your your pre order. And you would just do that kind of city after city and let your list know and and uh, that's how you'd stack up the orders um, when it's on pre order. Now I will say, Sven, in order to make this actually happen, you'd have to be working with a traditional publisher, which is its own. Yeah, uh, unfortunately. The the way that book distribution works through the bookstores, I mean, maybe I say that it's easiest to do through a traditional publisher. The way yep. that you would do it independently is you would contact independent bookstores. So you would actually probably not go through Barnes & Noble um, or at least not many Barnes & Noble. So you would probably contact the big local independent bookstores and say, hey, I'd like to you know, do this um, this pre order campaign with you and, and work it out logistically with them. But uh, yeah, there would there would there would be some logistics conversations. Okay, that's that's interesting. So, um, what if I don't have an audience yet? Let's say I don't know if I have an email list or many followers on Instagram and whatnot. Um, if I don't have that, how can I make that book tour happen? So that was my case, right? When I published my book, I had 75 emails on a list because they were my clients, <laughs> right? Yeah. And and so I 75 to 100, somewhere in there. And so uh, what I did personally, and we have actually re- repeated this with, um, you know, hundreds of our authors as well, is I put a lead magnet in my book, right? And it's not that complicated mm-hmm. of a concept. It's like at the very beginning of my book, there's a link that you can go to to download the audiobook version for free. And mm-hmm. so that okay. gained, and I just, you know, I got someone to record the audiobook for me. It's an MP3 file. Yes, it's on Audible, but it's also an MP3 file. So I just deliver the MP3 file to them via email, and now I have their email address. And so we actually use the book to um, to grow that that platform. Uh, and And so, you know, you can put something at the beginning of the book, you, if you have a companion course, you can refer to that companion course throughout the book. Uh, I recommend using QR codes now mm-hmm. because yeah. uh, Amazon has been fiddling with whether it allows a link to be clicked. For instance, from the look mm. inside, sometimes that can't be clicked. So a QR code is actually uh, has become uh, quite uh, approachable for, mm-hmm. for most consumers. And, um, and then, yeah, you just want to get people from your book onto your email list and then every time that you are promoting your book you are um you're building your email list at the same time and growing that audience for a product a service your next book um any of those options yeah so you would definitely do that tour so you would say okay if i write a book i need to do some kind of tour and you can you need and you need to build like a list before that Obviously. Um, yeah. So I would probably start with um, digital marketing before I did in person marketing. And that's certainly what I personally have mm-hmm. done as well. You know, a lot of these things, uh, you know, talking to folks on a podcast is something like you're in Switzerland, mm-hmm. I'm in Texas. <laughs> you know, this is, this is a relatively simple. And then we're, we're getting the, the message out to many, many folks. Right. Um, yeah. So I think there's huge leverage in online marketing first. To mm-hmm. gather that initial email list, so that when you go out to certain cities, maybe you do, you know, a couple of cities where you know your audience is, and, and send out that email or that um, that social media post um, because you know that there are folks there who want you to come do a presentation. So I would probably start with online marketing personally. Hmm. So you, but you, but do you then, if you do online marketing successful successfully, do you? Do you think you still need that live presentation at all? The live presentation, maybe, maybe the book not. tour is really only if you want to try to hit an, a bestsellers list, a New York Times list. Hmm. So you get the pre-orders yeah. in those respective bookstores. Uh, yes. Ah, interesting. It's only, so the whole game of book tour pre-orders is just to hit the New York Times list. For many of us, you know, at the end of the day, especially if it's a first book, we're like, eh, I don't care. <laughs> like, I don't care if I hit the list because really this book is 
um, to grow. It's to set me on a new trajectory. It's to help me, um, you know, gather mm-hmm. a bigger list and following and thought leadership and help me get onto stages. I don't need the I don't need the New York Times list, right? Like I just need to get my book out. I need my product that I can sell to folks. When they read my book, they join my list. You know, it helps me to get on podcasts, get on stages, get in front of, um, you know, other other folks. And 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 so for most of my authors, we're not worried about we're not worried about hitting the New York Times because that's not their goal. Their goal ultimately comes down to I want more readers. How do we get more readers? Yeah. We can achieve that with Amazon and online marketing, as you know. Absolutely. So, because if I imagine that, if you need 10,000 pre-orders, and let's say you have a 10% conversion rate, you would need an audience of 100,000 people attending your uh, book tour events. I think that's a lot. (laughs) It is a lot. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes. So that's typically a conversation for folks who do have either a larger built-in audience. That's why so many traditional publishers will only take folks who have a 100,000 person audience these days because they know conversion rates as well as you and I do. <laughs> and they're like, we want, we want you to come preloaded with your, with your buyers. So yes, for many of us... But how do they know if you have, have 100,000 people? Followers. You have to, you have to, um, in the proposal, when Prove you it. ask a traditional publisher Can. if they will consider publishing your book, you have to reveal your numbers. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I see. So, yeah. So, for a lot of us, you know, we were talking earlier about like this, this whole concept of starting small and um, just getting mm-hmm. products out the door, getting those um, directly to your customers. That's that's really where I play more in, and 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 that and my philosophy is more about let's get the book out the door. Make sure we have a way for people to go from the book to my email list. Let's get that Amazon sales page high converting because mm-hmm. so many readers are already on Amazon. It's low friction. Yeah. They're on Amazon. They're browsing for books. They're using keywords. They're browsing categories. Let's stack it with reviews, and um, and then take it out to digital marketing platforms. Um, some people run ads, some people do organic, um, mm-hmm. but every single person that we bring to, you know, a book sales page, they buy the book, they get from the book to our email list. Um, that's growing our audience. And that's mm-hmm. at the end of the day, the bigger our audience is, the more that we can sell not only one book to them, but multiple books or back end products and services. Okay. Thank you. What do the uh, most successful authors actually have in common from your perspective, working with all of them? They're entrepreneurial. They really are. And we we publish across sort of adult trade books. So we publish um, memoir and fiction and nonfiction. And all of them have that entrepreneurial bent of like, this is my product. I care deeply about my message, my mission, growing my audience, connecting directly to my readers. And they're willing to really take the book out and, you know, hit the hit the pavement, so to speak, you know, metaphorically. It's like they're willing to um, go out and pitch to podcasts and mm-hmm. get in front of groups and reach out to influencers on Bookstagram or Book Talk. And they're willing mm-hmm. to ask for endorsements um, and, and kind of put themselves out there, uh, which is quite different than the type of author who just wants a big traditional publishing house to take care of it for them. It's like, well, mm. then you're licensing your content to somebody else and maybe they'll do a good job and maybe they won't. Um, but the folks who are like, no, I want my own book. You know, this is my book. <laughs> I want to take it out to the market and I want to, I want to see its success and I'm willing to, to, really, to sacrifice and be uncomfortable in order to get that success. Those are the folks who really, um, especially year over year, see um, incremental improvement in the sales of their book, the reviews on their book, uh, the size of their their audience. And how does that uh, usually work? Is it like someone keeps selling the same book and tries harder year after year? Or is it just like, okay, next book, next book, next book? It depends on your model. Um, I have exactly one book. <laughs> really? Works for me. Like I just take it out to to different um, different audiences, and 
um, you know, it's nice because anyone who reads my book and then wants to work with my company, they know exactly how we're going to approach writing a book. You know, they've already read through my framework, my principles, uh, and and they're they know what to expect when they work with my company. And same would be for you, Sven. You know, like if if you wrote a book on this this um, sort of self-reliance, independence, you know, direct to direct response mar- marketing to directed to consumers, um, they're going to know about you and your how you work in the world. And so by the time they get through that and they connect with you, maybe they join your email list, maybe they reach out to you, um, they're going to want to be your clients. And, and so they've already, that litmus, litmus test has already passed. Um, I was I going see. somewhere else with that uh (laughs) but they uh i was i was i started going down one path and then uh and then i thought of another path and i'm trying to get back over um but they you know they know who you are and how they want to work with you and so i mean ultimately that is um the the type of person who is successful long term in the book knows that the gathering the readers who are willing to read the book, they will be with them over over the long haul, whether they're writing a lot of books or whether they're writing one book and and bringing them in. Even folks who write an entire series, so if you think about the big fiction series, the Harry Potters, whatever, Mm -hmm. it's the first book that's really being marketed most. Um, Ah. And then the second books are, essentially they function as back-end products and services. In fact, in the publishing world, um, it's often called the backlist. So you've got mm-hmm. sort of your big book, your first, you know, first book in the series that you're pushing, and then yes, people will uh, come for more books. So it really, we we at the top we sort of talked about two different ways that people make money from books. Both work. So you can publish one book, keep publishing more books, but market that first book, or you can publish one book sell back-end products and services, keep marketing that first book. Um, both work. I see. That's interesting. Yeah, there's um, in the direct marketing world, there is a, let's say, a concept called free plus shipping. You might have heard of yes. that. What do you think about that? I like free plus shipping. I've done some pre- free plus shipping models, um, funnels in, in my model. Uh, they are trickier to work. You have, you really have to be willing to get into the weeds with the, with the numbers, with the KPIs, with the, with the conversion metrics. Not everyone who wants to publish a book wants to run a book funnel. However, people who do want to run a book funnel, you can make it work absolutely, especially for nonfiction, right? Because you've got mm-hmm. your your book at the front end, and then you've got your one click upsells on the back of that funnel directly so you can get a positive return on ad spend right off of that you know that 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 single interaction and then you also have grown your list of buyers and now back-end products and services so yeah absolutely yeah i even i can tell you uh stories of german authors like in the the um the german new york times is called spiegel which is which means mirror in English. Um, but, and I remember an author who was also a successful online marketer who actually sold his book that he, that used to be a bestseller in like 10 years ago or so. And he, he sold that in an, in a free plus shipping funnel. And then it became a bestseller again in a <laughs> Spiegel bestseller, which, which means that, um, like just just selling it through an online funnel basically for free just for the shipping um created so much interest within the population so that as a result of this interest people started buying it outside of this funnel by a lot so a lot of people started buying it like in bookstores and amazon stuff like that so it became a bestseller again without him intending it so i think free plus shipping can can help like I, you just have to figure out what to do first, and do 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 you will you do free plus shipping later or earlier? But it can help actually, even with the non free plus shipping sales. I think you're right, Sven. I think you're right that when you advertise anything, 
you know, even if it's uh, as part of a direct response funnel, uh, you're getting that image in front of people. So they're thinking yeah. about it. It's in their brain now. Now the next time they go to Amazon or bookstore, they they might look for it. It's a little bit trickier to control that customer journey. <laughs> as you know, yeah. it's like, well, how much do I need to spend to get people to buy 10,000 copies from, from bookstores? And in the US, you would have to think about the geography because, the, for instance, the New York Times is pretty straightforward that they want it to sell on the West Coast and the East Coast. They want it to sell in Ohio and Florida, right? Like they want the spread um, of, of to prove that it is sort of impactful nationwide in order for it to make a nationwide bestsellers list. I wonder if you could do a campaign, though. This would be cool. Okay, so that, I've never done this before. Uh, this, okay. is, this is pure theory. <laughs> but what if, and I'm thinking especially about the U.S. because it has that wide geographic spread, what if you ran advertisements based on geography? You're running advertisements in San Francisco, like, you know, with the geography radius. You're targeting yeah. folks who are currently in San Francisco, Seattle, Chicago, Miami, you know, Houston, New York, right? So you pick like 10 cities and you're going to put the geographic bubble on those ads mm -hmm. and you're going to start the ad maybe like a week or two or three before you come to the city. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So That's you start advertising it and then you and then you say, oh, and then and then there's a, a follow up ad or an additional ad that's like, by the way author is coming to X bookstore in San Francisco, you know? And so now it's been rolling around in their brain. Maybe they got the direct response marketing ad. Maybe they bought the book. Mm. But now they're like, oh, Sven's coming to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, I want to go see him. So maybe you could drive interest that way. I mean, that would be cool. I've never done that, but I'd be happy to, if anyone wants to do that, hey, hit me up. <laughs> I'd be up for experimenting that's on that. That's cool. Yeah, I li I, li I like that thought. Yeah, that's that's how I would approach it. Because if I need, I mean, I would email to my email list if I would sell a book or like make a presentation of the book in San Francisco. But I have no idea whether anyone like from my email list would would really come. Uh, the the way to be sure for me is absolutely what you just described. You know, like target, like come up with a certain order of ads, uh, certain variations of ads, and then just target them and become known and uh, become talked about and then tell them that you're going there and probably add an incentive too if you come. Yes. Yep. yep. I think that's an important element, that incentive, that ex extra incentive. Yep. And one thing that you can do, again, I have not personally done this myself, but I've heard of other authors who have, you can host an event that is not at a mm. bookstore. So you could rent out your own restaurant or event space that you want. If you think that you might get a thousand people in a room, rent an event space that has a thousand room for a thousand people, and then the bookstore can actually bring a mobile point of sale. And so the bookstore can essentially mm. come to your space. They can run the orders in the back of the room. It still goes to the bookstore. It still counts for um, you know, New York Times uh, bestseller list qualification. And, um, and so then maybe, I mean, maybe we're converging on like all, all the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I think this is what we should do actually. Let's do it. Because there's <laughs> online, offline, and there's all this. Sounds very interesting. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, maybe you can even upsell from the, from the stage. It's like, oh, go buy my book and get these bonuses. And, you know, if you want to, I don't know, Join my mastermind. <laughs> here's the here's the yeah. order form for the mastermind. You know, it's it's been interesting. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk just broke all the publishing model numbers when he uh, released his most his most recent book. Um, he sold a million copies in 24 hours. Now this guy is so impressive. He was not actually selling the book. <laughs> mm -hmm. You go and look at his like you know what he was releasing on social media at the time. The messaging was. I'm I am dropping an NFT. This uh. NFT is going to get you into my three years of my live event. The mm -hmm. only way you can get to my live event is if you have one of these NFTs. And the mm -hmm. good news is it's very easy to get an NFT. You buy 12 copies of my book and I will give you an NFT. <laughs> oh, wow. And you have... 
from now until 24 hours from now to take advantage of this. And so his audience went and they they had to buy through Barnes & Noble. They had to buy through a local independent bookstore. They had to buy through a bookstore that would count for the list. So he dropped the links for Barnes & Noble and the other big online bookstores, uh, but independent, not Amazon. Um, Amazon doesn't play well with, with the other mm. bookstores and <laughs> publishers and things like that. Amazon counts, but it, it can't be the only store. It must have representation mm -hmm. in Barnes & Noble and local independent bookstores. So he dropped all those links, said you have to buy through these locations, buy 12 of them, and I will give you an NFT, and that NFT will get you into my live event for the next three years. Million copies in 24 hours. So there's going to be some interesting ways in which wow. <laughs> all of these ideas converge in the book world. This is so interesting that you mention NFTs. What do you personally think about NFTs? And do you think that um, authors should use should make use of NFTs, or is it just a more like a Gary Vaynerchuk thing? Since he is like especially he is specialized on NFTs, he is in the NFT business, so to speak. Yeah, I I think it's still early days on NFTs for authors. Uh, I do think there's a place for NFTs in the book world uh, because if you think about mm -hmm. it as a collectible, there's a couple ways. An NFT is a collectible. An NFT gives you uh, community access, you know, access to a community or yeah. um, access like how Gary used it to an event, you know, um, a, a, a sort of unlocks privileges. Um, if there were an NFT that you know, was associated with J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit and it was his original sketch of the Shire, you know? And so you got like, mm -hmm. you know, the artwork itself and the NFT of the artwork and, you know, that would be valuable, right? Because it's a collectible. The problem is, as we just mentioned earlier, Sven, there's so many books and so many authors. Are, are average readers going to start buying NFTs, betting on which authors are going to make it? I don't know. I don't think that we've reached that sort of um, level of saturation or sophistication in the market that people are just going to start buying NFTs of authors. Uh, so I, I wouldn't release it that way. I wouldn't release it as like, well, you want to buy my NFT because you know I'm going to be so famous, <laughs> you know, <laughs> 40 years from now. It will be so valuable. How I might want to use it, but this requires an audience. How I might want to use it is the way that Gary did, like buy my book and or buy multiple copies of my book and you get, um, you know, an NFT that unlocks these bonuses for you. And now that NFT, hopefully, as your book gains popularity and your audience grows, that NFT might become more valuable. Um, but I don't know how it yeah. stays with the book. Um, I'm not sure how that might yes. play. Absolutely. Yeah, the thing about NFTs is, because I know a little bit uh, about them, um, since I also bought some of them and some of my friends are really big in that business, uh, one of the one of those is one of those authors with the Spiegel mm -hmm. bestseller list, actually. Mike Hager, hello, Mike. Um, actually, it's this, somehow Gary V branded himself with NFTs. And there is a thing called NFT investing. So there's people actually speculating on NFTs to go up in value. And um, Gary Vaynerchuk has such a huge list, such a big reach, such a big following um, that actually he gets a lot of people to also buy his NFTs. Not just for the sake of um, having access to his event, but also for like speculating on the increase of value the potential and he does that really well and he even gets a cut when they trade this among themselves it's very it's very interesting and the and and because he has he has such a big audience and he is in the nft business and he uh, releases nfts um that are kind of like one of the first nfts to be ever collected and whatnot uh the v friends gary uh, the, is how they are called. Um, he actually, yeah, he actually enables his NFTs. He makes his NFTs stay valuable. It's very interesting. Just because he has this big audience and he's an NFT guru and he makes this audience trade NFTs amongst among them, and uh, that that's very smart of him to do. So 
as a side effect, of course, he sells a lot of books. That's cool. Um, helps his personal brand. But it's it's so interesting because it's really it's almost like um worthy for the SEC to look into it because he's creating an investment object and he is um let's say positively manipulating for lack of a better word the value of it and he you know he uses all kinds of things that are done in other realms like your books and bookstores in order to uh, make his investment vehicle more valuable for potential investors and more interesting for potential investors and, and then he adds this functionality you know this access to his event which you supposedly you will be learning how to invest in nfts and whatnot so it's it's kind of <laughs> it's a, you see where it's going it's 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 a very smart and interesting business thing that he does so it's really about he creates something and i have to say it out of thin air an nft is a graphic out of thin air in this case um so he scribbles his re friends i think he's left-handed even um and says okay this is a collectible it's very valuable he drives up that value and uh as a side effect he becomes like one of the most successful authors of all time I have to say genius. I have to, you know, take my hat off. <laughs> That's genius. Yeah, and, and Gary Vaynerchuk's a great person to to model that um, that author pathway. He is an author, yeah. right? This is not his first book. He's written no. books for over a decade, right? And uh, I think most of them have been through traditional publishing. I bet not anymore <laughs> after this. Yeah. I think he'll just sell them himself. Um, but, you know, he, he did the work. He put out a book. He went and, you know, did the all the... Um, marketing and and that sort of thing on you know bootstrapped himself sort of through marketing those books marketing himself getting himself on social media platforms things like that and you know over more than a decade of releasing books and growing a business and growing a brand this is where he is and I think both you and I Sven would sort of say we we all start somewhere we all start small we all start with that minimum viable product and getting it out to our consumers and the same thing goes for for books. You know, it doesn't. Our first book doesn't have to be the Runaway New York Times bestseller if we are in it for the long game. If we yeah. really believe in what we are building, and yes, it's going to take three years, five years, ten years, but we know we can see the vision of what we're creating, the community we're creating, the business we're creating, the products and services we're creating, and we know a book is that early piece of it. And we're willing to see it through the long the long run. You ask what what makes an author successful, that entrepreneurial bent and the long term vision, and willing to to go out and boots on the pavement, get get that publicity for not only your book but yourself, you know, as the author, as the business owner. Yeah, I mean, he's for me. This is even more than entrepreneurial. This is like he's creating an investment vehicle, yes. and he drives up that value. Of this investment vehicle, so this is not. This is basically printing money. Yes, <laughs> yes. And and so it's beyond entrepreneurial. That that's the next level. This is like uh, end game. <laughs> but he started. You know, if you go follow Gary's early years, he just always pushed the envelope on what's possible, what's possible, what's possible. You know, and, yeah. And so he might have started selling wine at the wine store in New Jersey on YouTube videos, right? I mean, that was his origin story. Um, and now, because he's invested in the long term, what is it, 20 years later or whatever, now he's creating, yes, uh, essentially like a new, as you said, investment vehicle from thin air uh, because of that following, because people yeah. believe in him. Yeah, it's it's so interesting. Um, so what... What do you do? You like um, what do you advise your clients um, regarding if you look at an example like Gary V and NFTs and stuff? Do you advise them to you know follow his footsteps and push the envelope? What what do you tell your people? I, I think it to make an NFT really work for your advantage as the author. I think you do need the following. Um, I think you need people yeah. who believe in you. There are experiments that are being floated in the book world about, can we have bookstores that sell NFTs and things like that? But those are obviously going to benefit the bookstores, right? Those are not going to benefit the individual yeah. authors, much in the same way that bookstores 
currently benefit the bookstores. <laughs> bookstores don't care whether your book sells, they just care that a book sells. <laughs> and and yeah. so for for you as the author, I wouldn't I wouldn't get super excited about, oh, this bookstore says it's doing NFTs. You know, I, I think it's it's for you the author is always about like what does my readership look like? What does my audience look like? And how am I growing that? And, you know, I, I once you get to call it 10,000, call it 100,000, somewhere in that range of folks who are maybe on your email list, listening to your podcast, following you on social media, uh, coming to your events, then I think an NFT can make more sense because they're buying it because they believe in you as as an individual. And so you got yeah. to have that... Um, you know, that uh, big enough volume of people who are going to take action uh, to really make an NFT kind of fly is my, you know, my guess. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree. And on top of that, your audience should be somehow NFT compatible. So, for example, I have a, a very, very famous dentist friend. His name is Frank. And he also wanted to release an NFT collection for his followers and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I would focus on that because, you know, traditionally dentists are more like they're not techies, play around with new technology and whatnot. And to, you know, even buy an NFT, you would need MetaMask and you need you would need to know about blockchain and Ethereum and stuff like that. Um, so I... I, I told him, honestly, I told him, ah, probably that's not your audience, as opposed to someone like me being like, what, 2.0, uh, not 3.0, 2.0. I would say, okay, my audience would kind of appreciate if I would release NFTs. Like, okay, we have released awards, and what if together with these awards, you would get an NFT or maybe NFTs later down the road, and with this NFT, you could do something later down the road, you would get this or you would have to write to do this or that or get access to that party or that event and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that could be um, interesting. But your audience has to be somehow compatible, somehow interested. And in Gary Vee's case, he has a, he, his, his audience is totally an NFT audience because he's like one of the NFT gurus. So it absolutely makes sense for him. And he trained his audience. All those oh, yeah. podcast episodes leading up to that August, mm -hmm. September book launch for like six months, he was talking about why NFTs are important. Here's how, here's a tutorial, get your MetaMask, get your wallet, get your, you know, account set up. Like mm. he was training people yeah. so that they were ready when he did this big V friends drop. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so interesting. It's so, such an, it's so interesting to watch. I, I'm honest, I have not. I've never released any NFT. It's so interesting to watch what other people like Gary V are doing. I mean, I think I have big respect for him and he did everything right. And um, uh, it's it, it's really amazing how he keeps pushing the envelope and keeps doing his thing. Yeah, and, and they'll it's become really more cool. approachable over time, right? The, these platforms will eventually become like anything else. We don't know how yeah. PayPal works. We don't know how credit cards work. We don't know how a lot of these things work. We just sign up on the app <laughs> And then the app does all the backend work for us. NFTs and cryptocurrency will eventually reach that level of approachability. Yeah, and they have to because ultimately it, it can also create problems for the publisher of NFTs. If you release an NFT, how do you charge sales tax and VAT, especially in European countries? If you don't, which most people don't, um, how do you declare that in your tax declaration. And if you, for example, make money from people selling NFTs and trading NFTs among each other, you also have to pay taxes. You also There is also VAT and uh, whatnot. You have to figure this all out. And this is not yet covered by any platform or anything. So um, I think this is also, at least in Europe, it's, it's a huge threat actually. Because if you sell NFTs left and right and you're happy and, and, and you get rich from doing that, yeah. But if you forgot to pay taxes on that, then it could create a problem. And it's all visible. Like once once the government has your um, blockchain address, you're super visible. I, I, it's super transparent. Like you, you cannot hide anything. So, it's, so this idea of anonymity uh, on the blockchain is not real. 
it's like you're super, super transparent. Like every penny is transparent. So yeah, yeah I'm curious how, how that will turn out. Yeah. Yeah. So if we have anyone who's listening and they're like, yeah, I don't want to do NFTs. Good news is books are really easy to sell. <laughs> right. Here's a book, 20 bucks. Thank you very much. Yeah. As, as one of the last questions, yep. uh, thank you so far for your uh, insight. Um, what, what are the topics that are the most successful mm. with real books? Yeah. So as with any market that does uh, sort of change over time, and yet there are, there are some topics that are more uh, stable. So you're going to have, I guess I should say it this way, like uh, you're, you're always going to have folks who are looking for a really good novel and there are certain um, mm -hmm. peaks in the publishing world that people are looking for. Right now, they're looking for LGBTQ authors and stories, right? So that's kind of a trendy thing. Um, however, people are Is always looking for a good crime novel, mystery novel, romance novel, that sort of thing. So. The base genre is is often quite quite stable, although they're going to be trending things um, sort of inside of that base genre. I would say the same is true for non uh, for nonfiction, right? Business books, marketing books, sales books. These are all going to be uh, so people are always going to be looking for the next sort of trend in that genre, um, and so maybe there's a bit of a spike in something to do with NFTs or well, direct response marketing has been around forever. Those kinds of books. I mean, you know, um, but but uh, you know, the the new angle in that direct response marketing. So I think that's the challenge for us as authors is to find w what is our um, sort of tried and true topic or genre that we're really speaking to, and what is the new angle or take that we are giving to the author. Uh, sorry, to the reader. So if the reader has read 20 books in this space, um, what is the new insight or uh, awareness or understanding that your book is going to provide to them? And uh, this is something that actually academics are quite good at because academics write a lot in the same topic. And so every single article that you write as an academic, you have to address, here's all of the literature, it's called. Here's all of what um, is is has already been said on uh, on this topic, and here's my unique contribution. I think as authors, mm. even for a trade audience, that mindset can be very helpful. I should read a few books that my readers might have picked up already. You know, I should kind of know what are those comparable oh, yeah. titles. What are those um, those 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 best selling books in this topic or genre, so that when I launch it. I'm able to talk to authors and say, look, if you loved those books by Dan Kennedy and, you know, Chet Holmes and whatever, you know, like, you know, list the, the authors. If you loved those books, you'll love this book because I bring this insight, you know, that has, you know, that Ooh. maybe you hadn't considered before. So you want to make that connection for your potential reader. Yes, I am speaking to books by authors you already know and love. And this is a little bit different than maybe what you've seen before. So that can be very helpful, both in conversations with a big traditional publisher. You have to do that in a proposal process. And just for book marketing in general, you always want to be um, talking to the readers, knowing that the readers have already consumed books on this topic. And then what's what's my unique angle? So you can find that for any topic mm. or genre. Um, it just takes a little bit of, um, you know, intentional kind of digging into it from from your perspective as the as the author before you bring it out to market. Thank you. That's very good uh, insight. Um, what do you think of ChatGPT and writing books? I love this question. Probably everyone asks you this question. This question I, twenty times tell, a day. Right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and you know my answer has been evolving. You know, as we've seen what ChatGPT is capable of. Right now. Uh, The short answer is I think of ChatGPT and AI in general, Jasper, these other tools, as um, very good writing partners. So um, mm -hmm. they, you know, they have access to the whole internet. Do you want the the uh, the book to? Do you want the ChatGPT AI to just write a broad strokes book that's just spitting out information? No, probably not. You know, that's not going to be yeah. um, interesting to really anyone. However, If you are writing a particular chapter on direct response marketing, 
you might say, what are, you might ask ChatGPT, so what are some of the, you know, common practices, best practices in direct mm. response marketing? What are some of the, what do people say is a, you know, a, a, um, a, a disadvantage of direct, direct response marketing? And so you mm-hmm. can get, you can be in a conversation with it to, to yeah. try to pull out what you might be missing, you know, because we all have mm. kind of blinders on and we think this one yeah. way and we we um, forget to ask additional questions. But we can kind of do that sounding board with chat GPT and it will prompt us. Uh, well, if we prompt it, it will provide us, you know, with things that we might not have considered that we could cover. Uh, so so I think about it as like, especially in that brainstorming phase when we talked about you're making that list of all the topics you want to cover and getting that fairly um, dialed in. It's a really good time to start chatting with with ChatGPT and sort of saying, "Okay, I'm thinking about a chapter on conversion rates. Like, what are some of the mm. you know common questions about conversion rates? You know, and and you're gonna know ninety plus percent of what ChatGPT is gonna spit out, um, but it might give you something that you hadn't considered, or it might phrase things in a way you hadn't considered. Cool." copy paste grab that put it in no problem um what people do want from you though is your stories your uh philosophy your frameworks and chat gpd doesn't have access to that most likely um actually there's an interesting uh jason fladlin is a webinar guy and he recently dropped a podcast episode where he asked chat gpt you know what are best practices of a webinar and ChatGPT said, well, according to Jason Fladlin, which mm-hmm. he hadn't prompted it to do, but he's a you know popular webinar guy in, in the States, it spat out all of these responses of, of quote unquote Jason Fladlin's best practices. And then he did a podcast episode <laughs> sort of saying what ChatGPT Chat got, got right and wrong and, and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, he has the advantage in that ChatGPT actually knew who he was. Most yeah. of us, ChatGPT has no idea who. Morgan gets McDonald is and what I would say about writing books. And so that's your disadvantage for most of us is ChatGPT doesn't know what you would say. So you kind of have to bring together mm. both. Use it for it might have considerations that you hadn't thought of. And it's not going to have all your stories and frameworks and philosophies. So you kind of got to bring them together. Yeah, no, it absolutely won't. Uh, it, it's funny. ChatGPT actually knows who I am and what I did and what my company does. However, uh, it has like, it invents weird stories like about a co-founder that doesn't exist. And this co-founder, I forgot his name, but it was kind of interesting. Like Sven uh, played, founded uh, Digistore24 with uh, XYZ co-founder and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I will say one thing I'm excited about is there have been more platforms released where you as a content creator can upload your own videos, podcasts, um, recordings, and you can create your own little bubble of like the AI is only going to reference this bubble of content. That could be very interesting. I have not personally oh, yeah. played with that, but that's an, that's, an, that's a rabbit trail I'd be willing to go down. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My team is kind of doing that. So what they did, what my team is doing is they interview me at length and then they feed this interview to um an ai and the ai then is able to somehow grab my ideas and elaborate on them this is what my team does it's very very exciting very interesting maybe i should hook up with your team and see (laughs) how they do that (laughs) i mean we we can have a call and we can share ideas no problem okay cool let's do it that's not a problem (laughs) sure Morgan, thank you so much for your time. Um, if someone wants to get in touch with you or use your service or reach you, how can they do that the best? Yeah, the the easiest way is to go to paperravenbooks.com. I've got everything there uh, and that's that's super easy. Uh, you can also find me personally on social media. My handle is typically Morgan G. Mac um, on all of your social media platforms. So if you want to reach out to me, um, I'd love to be in touch with you and Sven, thank you for having me on. This has been uh, really fun and a uh, really uh, awesome thank conversation. So it's been super enjoyable from from my end too. So I hope it's been valuable for our for our listeners too. Absolutely, it was. Thank you, thank you, Morgan. It was a nice conversation, and um, I'm looking forward to the listeners and viewers' reactions to that. I'm really excited for that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
If you enjoyed this episode, hit the subscribe button and never miss an episode of Svencast again.